I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center. Uh, and for us, this is a particularly critical, even urgent moment to be discussing COVID-19, the Northern Triangle, and U.S. immigration policies. Uh, we know that this has been a turbulent, uncertain moment in terms of a global pandemic, but also in terms of the revision and the imposition of new U.S. immigration policies in the United States. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us two exceptional people uh, who will be participating in the webinar, uh, Dr. Lucrecia hernandez Mack and Professor Karen Musalo. Uh, before I introduce them, I want to give you a brief idea of what our format is going to look like. Uh, we will begin with brief presentations uh, by Dr. Hernandez Mack and Professor Musalo. Uh, then there will be a conversation between both of them and myself as the moderator. Uh, and then we will they will address the questions and comments you send in over the chat function uh, on your screen. You can send these uh, comments or questions at any time, and please send them to Julia Host. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Lucrecia Hernandez Mack. She is uh, a medical doctor uh, and uh, currently a congressional deputy representing the Movimiento Semilla Party. She served as the first female Minister of Public Health and Social Assistance for her country in 2016. Uh, and she is a founding member of the Inclusive Health Initiative and the Myrna Mack Foundation. She's a fellow of the Central America Leadership Initiative and a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. Uh, she has a deep commitment to human rights, democratic values, uh, and public health. So with that, let me turn it over to Lucrecia Hernandez. Oh, thank you very much, Harley, and welcome everybody. Let me um, tell you a little bit about the COVID-19 or coronavirus in Guatemala from a health systems perspective. And let me start by talking a bit about Guatemala. I'm sure most of you know about Guatemala, but um, for those of you that don't, let me tell you that we are a country with about 18 million people. Um, something that is very important for this epidemic is that people over 60 years of age is only 7% of the total population. So because we have a population pyramid with a wide base. Life expectancy is 72.5 years of age. And according to National Survey on Living Conditions, 59.3% of the population is poor. Of course, this percentage is much higher in indigenous population, which is 79.2% of indigenous population is poor. And uh, total, we have 23.4% of people in extreme poverty. We are, um, we are known for our inequality. We have a Gini index of 53. And in 2014, the poorest 20% of the population would get 3.3% of national income. And the richest 20% of population would get 57.3% of national income. So that's just a, a small view of, um, of, of why we have a big problem with inequality. We are also one of the countries that has the higher rates of chronic malnutrition and one out of two children under five is stunted. And at the same time, in 20% of households in Guatemala, there is one malnourished kid with one overweight mother. So we have the 
problem of malnutrition going both ways. We also have a very high infant mortality rate, which is 22 deaths, deaths of under one year um, children per 1,000 live births. And we also have a very high maternal mortality rate that goes about 113 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And of course, this maternal mortality rate is much higher in regions like the Northwestern region, which, is, um, which has a majority of population, of indigenous population. And for those of you who don't know, let me tell you that we were in an internal armed conflict between 1960 to 1996. So this was 36 years that prevented us from building a social state or a welfare state. So we really had a counterinsurgent state that instead of answering to social and economic demands with social and economic policies, it would answer with political repression and even genocide. And over this counterinsurgent state, we have to add neoliberal reforms, which basically left us or has left us with very weak public institutions that are very permeable to corruption and clientelism. So that's a very brief intro on Guatemala. Uh, let me tell you a bit about Guatemala's health system. We have two basic public health providers. The first one is the uh, Instituto Guatemalteco de Seguridad Social, which means the Social Security Institute in Guatemala that we call EGS. And this institution um, only covers about 17% of population. So what this means is that the Ministry of Health is basically the main health services public provider. Um, and when you look at the main, at the basic services of the Ministry of, of the Ministry of Health, you can see that it's lagging about 45 years. Its basic services has the, it can cover about 6.5 million people which is a population that Guatemala had in the mid 70s. That's why we, we, we say that we're lagging behind uh, about 45 years. Not only we have low coverage, but the healthcare model of basic services is focused basically on maternal and infant population. And this wouldn't be a bad thing considering the high rates of child stunting, infant and maternal mortality. But the thing is that this healthcare is not comprehensive and it's just limited to a basic package of services that don't address the social and economic processes that determine these health conditions. And when we look at the main causes of mortality in Guatemala, well, you can find diarrhea and pneumonia, of course, but you also find heart attacks, diabetes, strokes, accidents, and homicides. And for example, cirrhosis is one of the main causes of mortality and it, it's indicative of uh, problems of addictions or alcoholism. Uh, so we know that there are mental health issues also in, in, in our society. And the health system is basically not capable um, addressing this complex epidemiological profile. Also, when you look at the financing of the health system, you can see that we are spending about 6% of our GDP in health, but of these 6%, only 2% comes from public health expenditure. It's public. And the rest is basically private health expenditure. And of these uh, private health expenditure, most of it is basically out of pocket spending, which is one of the highest inequality forms of financing a health system. Um, you can also see that because you have low coverage of public health services and high private health spending, this means that healthcare is mostly for people who, who can afford it. Our health system is basically private, not because it was public and then privatized, but because we've never really had a public health system. Um, and so we have a health system that thinks of people as clients, um, that access healthcare through a market, or the health system that thinks of people as benef beneficiaries that access public healthcare from a public charity perspective. We are still 
we still need to build and strengthen the idea that we are citizens or humans with rights, including health. Um, when we look at how COVID-19 or coronavirus has been um, developing in Guatemala, what we can tell you, because there is little information, the government is not giving enough information about what is happening. So we have very basic general data, but we know that the first confirmed case uh, happened in March 13. And by yesterday, April 30, we had 599 cases. Uh, most of them are men, 64% of these cases are men and 36% of them are women. 10% of these cases have affected the, the population under 20. Most of the cases, 59%, has affected people between 21 and 40 years of age. 25% have affected uh, the segment from 41 to 60 years of age. And 6% of cases have happened on people over 60 years of age. We've had 16 deaths, and we know that the majority of deaths have occurred in people over 60, even 80 years of age. But we also know that at least one person between 31 and 48 years died. So it is true that the COVID-19 is affecting uh, people over 60, but we also see that uh, young people can be can die of coronavirus. Uh, this could be happening because we also have, although we don't have a lot of uh, people over 60, we do have problems with, like I said before, diabetes, hypertension, which are six um, diseases that make coronavirus present with, uh, with, uh, as a more grave or with, with more severity. Um, right now, we are testing, the, the country's testing symptomatic cases only. In the beginning, we were testing symptomatic cases that had history of traveling from countries with COVID-19 cases. And more recently, we are testing only symptomatic cases. It doesn't matter if they have any history of traveling, but there's still no testing for cases that don't show symptoms. Um, something that is very interesting in Guatemala is that almost 20% of our cases are deportees are um, uh, Guatemalans that have returned from the US and Mexico, basically. So out of the 599 confirmed cases, 108 are deportees. It is suspected that many of the cases outside the metropolitan region are connected to returned migrants that were not registered or quarantined. And um, many of the migrants that have returned have been subjected to stigmatization and rejection in the case of Guatemala. We also know that uh, until April 26, 70 Guatemalans were COVID positive uh, out, of, uh, out of the country. 60 of them are in the US. And we also know that 46 Guatemalans outside of Guatemala have died from COVID-19, uh, 45 of them in the US. So we do have uh, more, well, we have cases of deaths by COVID in the US. Let me talk about how the country has responded and basically what has worked or works for us. Um, for example, the state of calamity was declared almost two months ago and it was one week before the first COVID-19 uh, case appeared. So this allowed us to have very quick social distancing measures that I think that has helped to contain the coronavirus. So just a few days after the first case, malls, non-essential services, schools and universities were closed and um, gatherings, including sport or religious gatherings were, were prohibited. Also, public transportation was suspended Citizens and residents and diplomats were the only ones allowed to enter the country uh, with an imposed quarantine. They, uh, the government also established curfews, restricted mobi mobility outside of your region or departamento, what we call it. 
And of course, something that works for us is that population over 60 years of age is only 7% of the population. So um, if it's true that coronavirus is only, is presenting itself more as more severe cases in, in people over 60, well, our percentage of population is, uh, is small. So um, what has not worked or is working against us is, for example, the high rates of unemployment or the informal employment sector. We also see that social distancing and uh, has been the, me the measures of social distancing and containment have been relaxed. This is happening because at the beginning, the government would uh, send mixed messages about whether to stay or not stay at home. We also know that the private sector is pressuring the government, demanding to return to normality, if that's possible. And we also need, know that because people is um, because of people's economic needs, many of them have the need to go out of the of their homes and try to make a living. So this is not not helping um, families to stay at home. We also see public institutions with a very little ability to respond. For example, the Ministry of Health. Um, has not been able to stock up to um, habilitate the temporary health facilities. They are still precarious. The health workers do not have enough equipment for their protection. And you can see also that the government and public institutions have been unable to define who should be the beneficiaries and which should be the procedures for receiving uh, aid programs like food, monetary transfer, credit, vouchers, or whatever. And you see a lot of white flags popping up in rural and, and urban areas and along the roads. And these are families that are, that are, are saying that they, I, they are going um, through very difficult, uh, through a very difficult moment and they're hungry. We can also see that the government is very hesitant and resisting to testing more people. For example, asymptomatic people that have a history or a connection with somebody who was uh, positive. There is very little information, very poor detailed information about the cases and this lack of transparency, transparency generates mistrust. We don't know if it's a problem of unregistered cases or if the government is hiding something. So we are not fully aware of what the problem is, how it is developing, and this lack of information doesn't allow the authorities to make good decisions, we believe. Also, of course, we, can, we have to mention that there, the policies and programs for the reception, care, and quarantine of returned migrants are very poor especially for the ones that are entering by land. And um, I believe that the crisis has made more visible our precarious public health system, the migrant drama, how informal employment is, um, is playing in, during crisis, of course inequality, and it also is making very visible the weakness of public institutions and the lack of state that we have in Guatemala. We also have to be very aware of um, the collapse of health services in the future. Of course, hunger and um, possible violence or social outbursts. So this is what I have for you. I don't know if um, that's okay. Thank, thank you, uh, Lucrecia. Uh, mm -hmm. We are going to return to discuss some of the uh, very compelling issues that you raised. Uh, I'm going to introduce now uh, Professor Karen Masalo, uh, who is a professor of law at the University of California Hastings Law School in San Francisco. Uh, at Hastings, she founded the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies uh, and the Refugee and Human Rights Clinic. Uh, she has contributed to the evolving jurisprudence of asylum law through her scholarship and litigation. 
She has played a very significant role in this area, also with a deep commitment to human rights, democracy, uh, and creating a decent society. Uh, much of the legal work she has done, both as an attorney and as a scholar, has proved to be precedent setting in critical ways. So I'll turn it over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harley. And I want to uh, thank Dr. Hernandez Mack for her presentation. Um, I'm going to use a, pow a PowerPoint, but before I start, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the um, the really invidious role that the U.S. has had in the conditions that Dr. Hernandez Mack described about Guatemala, the long internal armed conflict, the, the poverty, the inequality, um, the U.S. going back to 1954 with its participation in the overthrow of the first democratically elected president of Guatemala and its support for murderous regimes. And so whenever I speak about U.S. policy, I want to root it in a, in a real acknowledgement of um, the negative role that the U.S. has had and its, and its culpability. So, um, so I, we'll go to the PowerPoint. I'll try to stay to about 10 minutes, but what I'd like to do just to um, give a little bit of where we're going is I want to describe the Trump administration's attack on asylum and its attempt to end protection for people and how its current policies have, have really um, added to the, the spread of COVID-19. So if we could get the PowerPoint up, great. Okay, so, um, so as I said, this, you know, let's look at what the, the administration has done to asylum and how its detention and deportation policies have had a really negative effect. So if we could go to the next slide. What I'm going to do, there have been so many negative things that the Trump administration has done in terms of refugee protection. So I have chosen um, sort of five policies that have really for all intents and purposes ended the possibility of asylum for individuals showing up at the US border. And this is a, a right that is um, enshrined in international law uh, that was laws you know, that were enacted by the US Congress, but the Trump administration through various directives and proclamations and orders and regulations has done an end run and, and managed to really um, So I've chosen you know, four or five of the most egregious policies uh, to show how he's dismantled. And, and then I will make the connections to the spread of, of COVID-19. So we're starting with a policy um, called metering, which began in May of 2018. Before the, this policy of metering, any uh, asylum seeker who showed up at the border had the right to seek asylum, could enter and go through processes, even if they they had the right to be considered. Metering, with metering, what the administration started to do was to say at the ports of entry, sorry, we only have the capacity to admit five or 10 asylum seekers today, leading to the buildup of tens and then hundreds and then thousands of people who were waiting um, in Mexico to have their chance just to come forward and to request asylum. And so there were these long lists that were maintained. And this photograph shows, you know, a list um, and a woman and her son who were, who, whose, whose time had finally come and they were called um, to be able to enter to seek asylum. So that was one of the first policies that the Trump administration put in. We could go to the next slide. So this next policy um, was the migrant protection. Uh, I see a typo on my slide. That should read uh, migrant protection protocols. And it's really one of those Orwellian um, names for a program, migrant protection protocols. Advocates really call it the uh, migrant persecution protocols or the remain in Mexico program. This was a policy that was rolled out in um, January of 2019. It applies now across the entire Mexico-US border, and it um, requires any asylum to seek asylum in the US um, 
to wait in Mexico. Now it's different than metering because with metering, um, individuals had to wait to enter the U.S. to pursue their claim, but they would be allowed ultimately when their name were call, was called to enter. This said, no, we'll take your name, we'll schedule you for a court hearing. It might be two months from now, three months from now, four months from now, six months from now. You're going to wait that entire time in Mexico. So we now have over 60,000 asylum seekers who are really uh, trapped, so to speak, some of the most dangerous uh, border towns that have that our U.S. State Department has has given uh, the highest level of advisory warning not to go to these uh, cities because they're so dangerous, and we have forced asylum seekers and families with children, pregnant women, people who are ill. Um, and reported cases of murder, rape, torture, and kidnapping of migrants who have been waiting um, in Mexico for their asylum hearing. I should say that the, the, this policy is supposed to allow individuals who are truly fearful to be exempted from the policy, but all of the human rights documentation shows that that um, exemption ignored um, by U.S. Um, adjudicators who have forced them back to Mexico and only in the most limited rare cases allowed them to come into the U.S. Even when they reported that they've been tortured, kidnapped and escaped from it in Mexico or been raped, they've been returned to Mexico to wait. If we could go to the next slide. Um, okay, so this next policy is um, the third country or, or transit ban. And this was rolled out in July of 2019. The reason I have a map on this um, on this slide is because what this with this policy requires is that any asylum seeker who has passed through another country before coming to the U.S. will not be permitted to apply for asylum in the U.S. unless they have applied for and been not and been denied asylum in a country through which they have passed. Well, if you look at this map, all of those individuals are passing through another country. Really, the only group of, of migrants that this policy wouldn't apply to is Mexico, Mexican asylum seekers coming. Um, but this has provided the, uh, the justification for just flat out denying asylum to any individual border um, and, and seeks asylum. Again, there is a possibility for these individuals to apply for a, a, a form of relief that's a higher, that requires um, a higher degree of proof than asylum, but very few people have succeeded in that also. Um, now, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, so then, um, you know, these just build one on the other on the other. So then, then there is something called a so-called asylum cooperative agreements or safe third country agreements with Guatemala, El Salvador, um, and Honduras. And um, this, <laughs> this safe third country concept is a concept of um, uh, when, when individuals are, um, can, can, be, can be safe and apply for asylum in another country, they should be re required to do so. And I mentioned the transit ban, and that's kind of along these lines, but this goes even further. Because what this does is these three countries agree to accept asylum who come to the U.S. that the U.S. does not want to accept their cases. It, these countries have said, "You can send them here. We're a safe country. We have asylum seeker. We have asylum um, systems. We'll adjudicate their cases." That means somebody from Cameroon, somebody from Guinea, somebody from Venezuela who comes to the U.S. seeking asylum can be sent back to Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras to seek asylum there. And I, I think for probably the audience uh, for this um, discussion we're having knows that these countries are origin countries for asylum seekers. It is a, you know, beyond a stretch of the imagination to say they are safe countries for asylum seekers from other countries. And they also do not have um, anything beyond the most 
nascent developing asylum systems such that they could accept asylum seekers from the U.S. and adjudicate their claims. And this is just a way for the U.S. to try to offboard, uh, you know, outsource its responsibilities to countries that have so much less resources um, than the U.S. So um, these these agreements um, have have gone into effect, but to date, Guatemala has been the only country that has actually started accepting people under the asylum cooperative agreement. El Salvador and Honduras have not yet um, done so. And then if we could go to the next slide. Um, so the most recent of these measures to really destroy the asylum protection system of the US was um, an order put, you know, issued by the Centers for um, Disease Control on March 20th of 2020. The order is called Suspending the Introduction of Certain Persons from Countries Where a Communicable Disease Exists. And this really used the public health emergency of COVID-19 um, to expel all asylum seekers. To, you know, all of the measures that I talked about earlier were ways to force people to wait in Mexico or ways to actually, you know, deny them asylum by saying you should have applied somewhere else. But this doesn't even have the pretense of considering their case, cases for asylum. It just basically expels them with zero process whatsoever. Um, it allows the U.S. to just dump them across the border or deport them to their home countries. And to the degree that there is this fig leaf or this pretense of this being to really protect the U.S., um, I, I will say a couple of things. This only applies to individuals who arrive by land without valid travel documents. So who are those people who are arriving by land without valid travel documents? Those are asylum seekers. If this was really a public health measure, it would apply more across the board to travelers and visitors to the U.S., and if the U.S. were to be um, uh, true to its obligations to protect asylum seekers, there are other ways than to expel them. And, and the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees has really criticized persecution under the justification of a public health emergency and has pointed out other measures that countries can take, such as quarantine or testing, rather than to just um, expel people and violate their rights um, to protection. So um, if we could go to the next slide and then the next slide. So these are, these are, um, these are photographs of detention. The first one was detention at, at, at border, uh, border stations. This is, um, yes, and then women's uh, detention, the women's detention um, center. And so one of the issues that has become, you know, very, very clear is just the spread of COVID-19 that in the conditions in, in detention centers, but well, let me back up and say, individuals who are here as undocumented, who don't have legal permission are detained, but the law is really, but it is civil detention. These are not people who have committed crimes. And from a humanitarian perspective, if they don't pose a security risk and they don't have criminal convictions, they should not be detained. They're not criminals, they're asylum seekers. Um, and our law really recognizes that. But this administration has had a policy of simply locking up. As COVID-19 began to spread, um, human, human rights advocates have said, you really need to release people from detention. The conditions in detention are impossible. It's just impossible to um, to protect people. And so there has been a lot of resistance to this. There was a study that was just, um, it's forthcoming in the Journal of Urban Health, that the estimated rate of COVID-19 transmission within detention facilities, that in an optimistic scenario, 72% of these individuals would be infected after three months and nearly 100% under the worst case scenario. The detention continues. The administration has resisted pleas to release people. There has been litigation in at least, I think, 14 states in the US. There have been a, a, a range of lawsuits and there has so, to date been no um, nationwide court ruling ordering ICE to release people from detention 
there have been you know mixed bag of of orders um in the most cases and i won't go into too much detail people can ask about it later the the courts have ordered that particularly vulnerable ill people be released but they haven't made for the most part um blanket order to, to release um, and there's been some special rules for children and now my i think it's my uh, last slide which is on um, deportation so detention and deportation so you have people who are in detention and then you deport them and so isis for the most part continue with its its deportations um to mexico and the northern triangle countries to haiti um and and you know there have been as 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 dr hernandez mack noted deportees are infected they're coming back to countries that do not have health systems that are able to 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 address this it is so morally unconscionable uh, and, and really uh, so irresponsible so uh, egregious to um to be deporting under these um circumstances and so um you know, I, 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 I could give more details, but uh, about the instances of COVID-19 and the deportees, but I'll, I'll stop there because I think what I wanted to do is just kind of give a, an overview of the immigration policies and how instead of them being sort of rolled back with any humanitarian consideration, they have only been ramped up and really are contributing to the worsening of COVID-19. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, these were two, I think, really superb presentations. I, I have a brief comment to make and then uh, a question for our speakers. Uh, the brief comment is uh, Dr. Anandas Mack uh, began her presentation uh, by putting the contemporary issues uh, in a historical context, and I think that is vital to understanding what's taking place today. Uh, Dr. Hernandez Mack has extraordinary experience in the health field, as I mentioned in her introduction, as a medical doctor, as the former Minister of Public Health, as someone in Guatemala. Uh, and what she pointed out is that a 36 year civil war. Uh, in which the various U.S. governments supported not simply murderous regimes, but at times genocidal regimes, created a failed counterinsurgency state, as she termed it, uh, as well as a neoliberal economy where today 2% of GDP goes to public health. With that as a context, there is, this isn't an abstract case. There is a certain moral and historical responsibility given what has taken place and what is taking place today. Uh, Professor Musalo also began with this precise context, the U.S. role uh, in terms of shaping COVID-19 uh, and U.S. immigration policy today which is upending the notion of asylum in a way that is, in my view, morally appalling, but also questionably uh, legally. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Masalo if there is a question she might want to ask uh, Dr. Anandas Mack. Yes. Um... Dr. Nandes Mack, thank you for a really excellent presentation. And I would ask you, what if we in the U.S. were to have an administration came in that really um, did want to have positive policies towards Guatemala, recognizing also the moral the, the, the moral responsibility that the U.S. carries? What in an area, any area you'd like to address, what would that policy look like. It could be, you know, foreign policy, it could be financial support, it could be immigration policy, but but what would be your guidance for what you would like to see from the U.S. in recognition of our really um, in, in egregious and evil role? Yeah. Well, you know that um, Trump's administration has been cutting off aid 
um, especially technical assistance for Guatemala. And this is because they say that the country is not being collaborative enough in order to contain the people that are mar that, that is migrating to the U.S. So what we need the government of the U.S. to understand is that people are leaving Guatemala because of the social and economic problems. So the best way to keep people in Guatemala <laughs> is addressing those social and economical problems. It's not about, you know, uh, having more police or military guarding the borders. It's not about um, detaining them and then returning them to, the, to, to Guatemala. It's about having more help or understanding of how to improve the social and economic processes in Guatemala in order to have people that, that are living with dignity and don't have the need to migrate to the US. So that would be like the first, the first thing. Um, and I think that here we, we also need the US to understand that in Guatemala, health is considered, considered a human right. Um, something that doesn't happen in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so we can see sometimes that perspective of the aid that comes from the U.S. regarding health policies. You can see that they have more a more neoliberal approach. And instead of strengthening the public health system, they are um, promoting policies that are chipping away mm -hmm. the need for having a strong state, a better state uh, that really guarantees health, uh, well, um, health, the health, um, the right to health, sorry. Um, so I think that would be maybe the main policy that I would like to see from the US government regarding migration. Uh, and then let me ask you, Dr. Hernandez, Matt, uh, uh, do you have a question uh, for Karen Musawa? Yeah, because in the, um, the traditional perspective of public health towards migrants is to see them as vectors or vehicles of disease. So sometimes the approach is to contain them and um, not look at them as humans, right? And the thing is that because the the migrants that are being deported back to Guatemala, they are being stigmatized. We don't have um, public programs that are able to take care of them, register them, have um, them return to their communities uh, in, in good health conditions. Do you think it's better if they stay in the US and we make some efforts that the US government and detainment facilities improve? Or do we ask the U.S. government to give them back and we try to, to take the better care of them here? Wonderful question. I, I think that, um, you know, two, two, things, two things to answer that question. One is there was actually a um, Cato, Insti Cato Institute study saying that there's no higher proportion of COVID-19 among immigrants in general in the US and the non-immigrant population. So it's so to the degree that the migrants are suffering from COVID-19, it is these detention facilities. In other words, the US is directly responsible, from my perspective, for their infection. And so if we start from that point, I would say the humanitarian approach is they shouldn't be infected. So that's the large legal effort to end uh, detention of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And if that can't be done, then I think the U.S. should take responsibility for um, testing people and shouldn't be sending back people who are infected for Guatemala with its sparse resources to take that responsibility. But I think if we start it with, the, with just taking away any stereotype, that somehow immigrants are, are vectors and, and are more likely to, uh, to have COVID-19, 
than, than, than the other rest of the American population because as I said, Cato Institute just released this study and I thought it was very interesting for demolishing that sort of stereotype about migrants. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to uh, turn this over to my colleague, Julia Bird, uh, the vice chair of the Center for Latin American Studies, who will read uh, the, some of the questions and comments uh, that you've sent over chat. Julia. Thank you, Harley, and thank you to everyone who submitted a question. I'm sorry to say we cannot get to them all, but I will start with two of them. The first question is from Liladar. How is the pandemic impacting indigenous communities in Guatemala? In the current COVID-19 situation, which mandates social isolation and shelter in place, how are the aldeas or indigenous villages coping with the lack of proper medical care? Does, apartment, does the Department of Public Health in Guatemala keep track of testing these individuals? And the second question comes from Beatriz. The United States has finally realized the contribution of immigrant workers, given that now the federal government has classified farm workers and food processing workers as essential workers. Do you think this classification will help asylum cases and in general, the legal regularization of the status of undocumented workers in the United States? Okay, so regarding indigenous people, we know that the health system in Guatemala is lagging behind more than 45 years. And the, the, the scarcity of healthcare facilities is even bigger in areas where the majority of population is indigenous. So we as a country are not able to, we, we, we have difficult coping with the general and day-to-day -day, uh, problems, health problems. Um, so it will be even more difficult to have an optimal response to the epidemic in rural areas and within indigenous population. Having said this, we also have this false sense of security that says that COVID is affecting mostly urban areas, but we know that uh, COVID is highly contagious and it's probably in rural areas affecting indigenous people and we are we are not being able to understand or even see the problem over there because testing is not massive we're not doing enough testing St testing is basically um, limited to people that have symptoms and in urban areas and um, so testing is being done more in mestizo populations that are in urban areas, but not in rural areas where the majority of indigenous people uh, are, are um, living. We do have some municipalities that have been affected and there are, the majority is indigenous and, we and, and they've been subjected to this sanitary um, measure using police and army and the military. So we do see that the sanitary response to COVID in rural areas and indigenous population is in a more militarized way than in the, in the cities or urban areas. We can say that. Um, but really, we are not, we are, I don't think that we have a good idea of what is happening with this epidemic in rural areas and in indigenous populations because we are not looking or questioning or testing enough in order to know what is going on. Karen. Okay, so um, Beatrice's question was a good one. This pandemic has really highlighted the contributions of undocumented workers or migrant workers um, in, in all the areas that she mentioned. But I think that we have always known in this country the, the contributions that immigrants um, make, but xenophobia and racism, national self-interest of us as a country to welcome immigrants. And I think the, 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 
good evidence of this is in the midst of this pandemic on April 22nd, the Trump administration issued a proclamation um, suspending the entry of immigrants. And this was a 60-day suspension of issuing immigrant visas. So these are people who are the, the grandparents of citizens or the spouses of lawful permanent residents that are being barred from entering under this sort of fig leaf of it's for public you know, safety um, and public health. And so I you know, think that um, until we have a new administration that isn't motivated by xenophobia and racism, it doesn't matter the contributions that immigrants uh, make because this administration will always you know, be guided more by its racism and xenophobia than by really what's in the national self-interest. And that's a sorry thing to say, but I, I think that it's been, um, you know, every day of the Trump administration, it, it has proven that its true objective is about racism and xenophobia and not about this nation's self-interest. Thank you, Karen. Julia. I'm actually gonna pass it back to Professor Shakin to conclude. Great. Uh, I just wanna make a brief concluding remark. I thought, uh, both presentations were particularly critical at this moment. Uh, and I am haunted uh, by the image uh, Dr. Hernandez Mack mentioned of white flags in front of more and more homes indicating hunger, desperation, possibly disease as well. There's something very, very disturbing of that image, uh, given that Guatemala could be on the cusp of a lot more pain with the virus. Uh, and uh, when Professor Musalo uh, mentioned the infection rates in detention centers, in some cases after a certain number of days being 90%, worst case scenario, 100%, uh, there's something deeply disturbing of having detention centers on where under the Trump administration, they have incarcerated in the US as many as 56,000 people a day at one time, that is, uh, over the last three years. Uh, there's something deeply disturbing about that. With all of this going on, there is a question we should keep in mind. Clearly, what is urgent is how to address the pandemic in the context of what's taking place today in Central America, in the United States, and elsewhere. But there's a moral responsibility for the United States government, given the role that we have historically played in Central America. Uh, and the consequences of that role. But it's also a moment to think about what could we do, a question that uh, Dr. Hernandez Mack answered very well, what kind of aid would we like to see going forward coming out of the pandemic, uh, which would shape the countries of Central America and the United States in a far healthier and more democratic way. So with that, I'd like to thank both our speakers and I'd like to thank all uh, of those uh, who participated. And we look forward to continuing this discussion uh, through the Center for Latin American Studies. So thank you.